Thank you for joining today's solid waste fee rule change overview. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items we're going to cover first before we get started with the presentation. So we ask um, everyone to please mute your phones throughout the call to eliminate any background noise. Uh, those calling in, if you need to speak at some point, you can press star six to unmute um, during the call. Uh, and to preserve bandwidth, we may ask you to um, turn off your cameras as well. So um, when you're speaking, feel free to turn that on, but just during the presentation, you can turn that off just to preserve bandwidth to ensure everything comes through more clearly. Uh, we will have questions at the end of the presentation. So in order to ask questions, you can either utilize the chat or raise hand feature. And if you look on the top bar of your um, Teams browser there, you will see a kind of a word bubble and also a um, smiley face with a hand up. So the raise hand feature, you would click that and you would be able to raise your hand. And if you do have any questions during that, we'll ask at the end. You can just uh, click on the uh, thought balloon and just enter them in and type a message and we'll ask those at the conclusion of the uh, presentation. Um, if you're not comfortable using that, you're welcome to email me. I'll put my email address in the chat. There's jeffrey.monovan at epa.ohio.gov. And we'll ask those at the end of the meeting as well. So, um, so this meeting is also being recorded and will be available to watch at a later date. So uh, with the housekeeping um, covered there, um, Ernie Stahl is going to present some information here. So Ernie, uh, go ahead and take the floor. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm going to go on and share my screen here. And Jeff, if you can tell me uh, when you if you see the presentation. Yep, it's up there. OK, so I appreciate everybody getting on today uh, to go over this. Um, I've asked Jeff, I've asked people to to wait to ask their questions until the end just because I have a I need to get through the flow so I don't forget things. And if you just if you're worried about forgetting your question as it comes up, just chat it in and then we'll get to it after the presentation is over. There should be a plenty of time for people to ask questions at the end. So uh, the reason we're here is to talk about the interested um, party release of the fee rules and that that governs the state fee, solid waste Sorry. management district fees and the host community fee rules. So let's just go on and jump into it. Um, there, just to go through the schedule of the timeline for the interested party release. So we issued it on November 23rd, and um, the original comment period was to end on December 23rd. And a couple things happened here. So to begin with, I forgot that people only get notified about rules when they've signed up for our listserv. So I should have sent an email to all of you letting you know they were available and it just didn't occur to me to do that. So I apologize for that. And then of course we launched our new website and we had some unanticipated issues with links which made the interested party information not available to you. So we did get a request to extend the to extend the comment period. So um We've done that. Now the new comment period will be issued or end on January 24th. I forwarded the notice that we sent out about that to all of you. Again, that would have probably gone out to the listserv. So unless you were signed up, you would not have gotten that. Comments will be due by 5 p.m. on January 24th. And then as I mentioned a couple of times, you have to register for the listserv. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you how to do that so that you in the future will get notifications about fee rules. So um, let's just go over some of the changes that are happening in the rules. So I'm just going to go over some non-programmatic things that were uh, the, the changes. This is the vast majority of what's changed in the rule. So the first thing is that we removed definitions from, from the definitional rule that are defined in our multi-program definitions rules. So when the fee rules were passed, those that multi-program definitions rule did not exist, and we had to have unique uh, definitions in our rule. They've since passed that rule and now um, we can move, eliminate duplicate definitions. So we've done that. The definitions didn't go away, they just got moved. We 
significantly reorganized the rule for clarity and flow. The old rule was horribly complicated and difficult to read. So we reorganized it and we removed a lot of redundant and unnecessary language. There was stuff that was repeated from statute that didn't really need to be in there. So we removed that. We also are now required to minimize the number of new regulatory restrictions. So basically, anytime we use a word like shall, must, we have to remove two for every one we put in. So part of our reorganization was to, to remove as many of those as we could. And as a result of that, just restructuring the rule resulted in us changing more than 50% of them, which requires us to rescind the existing rule and adopt a new one. So all of the language when we adopt it looks like it's new, even though it's not. So in terms of the actual programmatic changes, one that affected all the rules was that we added an exclusion for solid waste approved for use and that is used as alternative daily cover. So that material is not subject to fees and that's at because in 2017, the legislature added a provision to the law that exempted alternate daily solid waste used as alternate daily cover from fees. So we added that in to catch up with the statute. And again, that does affect <coughs> all fee types. There was another programmatic change that affected all rules, and that's that in May we adopted new rules that combined what previously had been two separate rule packages for industrial and residual solid wastes into one new rule that's called industrial or manufacturing waste. The residual waste is a, was a subset of industrial waste. There were like seven industries whose waste was considered homogenous, homogenous enough that they were called out into separate rule package that allowed them to have landfills with less restrict or with less components on them. Uh, when we combine them, it does not, it will change the waste categories that owners and operators will report. So in the future, any reports we put out will now have one category for industrial waste as opposed to the two previous ones. The change does not in any way impact fees that are collected. Uh, one of the things that I'm calling a non-programmatic change is uh, we had called this out mistakenly in the interested party fact sheet it having to do with the generation fee levied on um, yard waste delivered to a composting facility or to a solid waste transfer facility. That provision is in the existing rule now. Um, I been tr we got a few comments on this one and so we've been doing some research to try to try to remember the background on why that requirement is there and I could swear that back in the beginning of the program there was a requirement in law specifically referencing yard waste we don't have access to those old statutes right now until we go and they're in the office and we haven't had access to them in time for me to to look up for you guys but I think that it was a discrepancy at one time in the law between how the, the uh, state fee and solid waste district fees dealt with it versus the generation fee statute. So we're looking into that to see where it came from. Um, but the real intent for that one was to exclude source separated yard waste delivered to a solid waste transfer facility when that yard waste is then going to be delivered to a composting facility from being subject to the fees. So um, it doesn't read that way, but I believe that was the intention behind it. So our idea here, is, and I, we haven't run this by our legal department or anything, but our idea is to change the language from the way it currently reads to the uh, essentially saying the generation fee is not does not apply to yard source separated yard waste delivered to a transfer facility as long as the yard waste is going to a composting facility, and we would need to add that to the state fee statute as well because the same situation applies to the state fee at a transfer facility. So that's that's uh, our idea behind that. I apologize for calling it out in the interested party fact sheet. I don't know why. We were thinking it was a new change. It was a mistake on our part. Um, there is a new provision. So I'm going to go on in that in terms of the state fee rule, there are no real other major changes other than what I've talked about with the reorganize, reorganizing. There were a few changes to the solid waste district fee rule that uh, I thought you might need to be involved, informed about. So. One of them has to do with um, there is a provision in 
in all and the law, and I'm sorry, in the rules that when the owner operator of a solid waste transfer facility takes takes in source separated loads of construction and demolition debris, and then they mix them before sending it off to the landfill. So they mix the CNDD with the solid waste and then send it off to the landfill. Ordinarily, the solid the transfer facility would have to pay fees on the entire amount of the waste leaving the facility because they would have collected fees on the solid waste when it came in, but not the CNDD fees. If they don't collect the fees on the entire thing, then the landfill receiving it isn't going to know how much in fees they have to collect. So that's the way that it would normally be set up. There is a condition in there that if the transfer facility and the landfill are owned by the same company and they can demonstrate meeting certain requirements, they can get an adjustment to that so that the transfer facility can keep this can. How do I keep it? How do I say this? Keep different records on the CNDD and solid waste they bring in and then collect the CNDD fee on the portion of CNDD and the solid waste fee on the portion of solid waste. Um, and there are specific conditions to that. So I, if, if during the question and answer period, if I'm not clear on that, just feel free to ask me to clarify it and I will. But the, what the reason I'm bringing this up is because we added something into the rule for solid waste district fees to say that before the director can approve that alternate method of collecting fees, we have to get consent from the solid waste district. So with that previously was not a condition to approving the request. And so we've added that in so that we can get your voice in on that that change. So again, if I haven't explained it clearly, just ask me questions during the comment during the question period. There was another provision in the rule that is still in the state fee rule, but it allowed. So this is going to be another complicated one. So when a mixed material recovery facility, a dirty MRF, would take in solid waste at the front and then they would remove recyclables and then send waste off to the landfill. Uh, recyclables are not supposed to be subject to fees. So uh, if they took in solid waste at the beginning and then collect fees, and then take recyclables out and then send waste off to the landfill, they can't keep the fees that they accessed on the recyclables. So what, what we put in the provision was the ability for the owner operator of the MRF to say, okay, we, we know we recover over time this percentage of recyclables from the waste that comes in. So therefore, we're just gonna apply that recovery factor to the waste coming in and reduce it by that amount to account for the recyclables that are gonna be removed. And that way they didn't have to worry about record keeping between the amount of fees that they had collected up front and the amount of recyclables that they had removed before sending it to the landfill. So what we removed that from the solid waste district fee rule because we didn't really feel like it was our place to be making that decision for the solid waste districts. So it remains in the state fee rule. It is no longer, it is proposed to be removed from the solid waste district fee rule. Again, if that one doesn't make sense, how I've, how I've explained it, just ask me during the, during the question period. Um, that's really the major changes that would affect the solid waste management district fee rule. Um, the third rule that I'm going to talk about is the host community fee rule, and that is the one that allows a community that hosts a landfill to assess 25 cents on each ton of waste that's accepted at that landfill. And the purpose of that is to compensate the community for the costs it incurs by by hosting the landfill. So things like road repair from trucks, any extra emergency equipment that they might have to buy to respond to an emergency. Uh, and there's a few other things that are specified in law. So the question always comes up in terms of how do you assess a host community fee when the facility is in multiple government jurisdictions? And the total fee that is collected by all affected jurisdictions has can only be 25%. So there has to be a way of them sharing the fee. And currently, the rule, I'll, I'll go over that in a minute, but we changed the rule to try to add some flexibility for how those local jurisdictions split that fee up. So currently, the existing rule says that on or before the effective date of the rule, which at the time would have been either 2009 or 2010, communities only had the option of dividing the fee 
on or after that effective date, they could divide it equally. So what ended up happening in a couple cases, and I think there's maybe two situations in Ohio where, where multiple communities are splitting the fee based on the percentage of the facility in each jurisdiction. And what ended up happening in at least one case is that the facility isn't, isn't distributed equally amongst the communities, and the way the communities are compensated doesn't account for the portion that's in their community. So in one case, at least in the past, when the, when the percentages were determined, the hall road was in one community, but none of the rest of the facility was in that community. So they had an extremely small portion of the overall fee to compensate them for probably the largest impact coming from a landfill, which is road repair. So we tried to make it a little bit more flexible by removing that honor before effective date to give them the option to do either. Um, the problem is that in order to change how they're currently sharing the fee, communities that have the fee based on percentage of the facility will have to adopt new uh, resolutions to change it to equal share of the host community fee. And, you know, it, that could be a problem locally if the ones that are getting more of the money don't want to give it up. But we at least opened it up so that they're not stuck with having that one for the rest of time. Um, so let me just go over a little bit about what happens next in terms of the process. So uh, once, once the comment period closes on January 24th, we will do a response to comments. So we'll take all the comments that came in and we'll we'll come we'll provide a response as well as uh, what we're doing to address the comment. Once that's done, um, we will email the response to comments to the people who did comment. We have to send it to um, the the lieutenant general's general. Lieutenant General's Office for the Common Sense Initiative to look it over. So I'm not sure if the email comes out to the commenters before or after that passes that program, uh, but you will get that eventually if you submitted comments. Once we get past the Common Sense Initiative, we'll file the rules with JCAR, which is the Joint Committee on Agency Rule Review. When we file those rules, we'll also file the response to comments so that uh, when when the when you get access to the new rule the new rules you'll also have access to that response to comments. There will be another public comment period after the rules are filed with JCAR, and um, it will be at least 30 days. We will send out a notice that the public comment period is open through our list serve. And then um, so you'll be notified through the list serve again. I'm going to show you how to sign up to get those notifications. And then, um, as I said, you'll get that notice through the listserv. There's also, um, so let me just go over how to, to how to sign up for that listserv. You do that through EPA's website. So I'm going to send out this presentation to everybody following the, the um, following our our webinar here, and that way you can use the links that are that I've embedded in here. So let me just open up the listserv or where you subscribe to our listserv. Um, Hopefully this will come up on screen. And Jeff, can you see that? Yes, the website is up. Okay, so um, you have to first create an account in order to have access to this subscription page. It's extremely simple. Uh, you just have to provide a username and a password and you sign up for it. Um, once you're signed up, then you wanna go into this area that's called subscribe to updates and you have to scroll down to the bottom until you find the solid waste group down here. And notifications for fee, fee issues are done through the lists for solid waste landfills or for solid waste transfer facilities. So you can sign up for one of both of those and you'll get any notices that go out about fee rules. The downside is that you'll get notices that deal with anything having to do with those facilities. So um, once the fee rules are finalized, you can always come back in and unsubscribe you yourself from those lists if you don't wanna keep getting notifications about anything having to do with those facilities. Um, so I'm going to close that out and go back to my presentation. 
Oh, let's see here, advance. Yeah. So then we also do publish uh, any notifications in our agency's weekly review that's put out through our legal department. It is updated weekly, either on Thursday or Friday. I'm not sure exactly which day it is. Uh, we do not submit notices through the listserv about stuff that's in the weekly review. Uh, so you would need to check that regularly to see what's posted. And then we also have a public notice search. So you can look for any public notices that we would put out. In terms of submitting comments, you can submit them either by email or through the regular mail, and you would submit those to Michelle Mountjoy. Michelle is, I believe, on the meeting, so if I've said anything stupid at this point about the process, which, let's face it, I say stupid things all the time, so I probably have, she can correct me, or and she's also on here to answer any questions about the process that I may not understand. She's our rules coordinator and she's the one who deals with all of that. So she's the one that I always bother when it comes time to trying to remember what it is that we do. So that's that's what I had in terms of my presentation to go over what the changes are. Um, I, we can open up the floor now so that uh, people can ask questions if they have them. So uh, Jeff, I'm gonna quit sharing my screen here. Yeah, and just a reminder that if you do have a question, um, you can either use the chat, use the raise hand feature, or you're welcome to email me. I'll put that email address in the chat again. I apologize up front for any confusion that I created with e when we put out the interested party fact sheet and um, calling out that one requirement as a new as a new thing. Okay, and Ernie, it looks like Carol Phillips has her hand up. So, Carol, you can go ahead and unmute and um, ask your question. Okay, hey, um, just a real quick question on the rule about transfer stations, um, getting permission to submit the fees directly. Was there any um, intent that some of those transfer stations might be out of state, like East Coast transfer stations? No. Um, it was the intent is that it's a transfer station in Ohio and a landfill in Ohio. Fees aren't collected out of state anyhow. So um, if so that you know if we were going to approve something like that, it would it would not it would not it would not it wouldn't meet the criteria in order for an out of state facility. But I, I know that we did get a comment asking us to put in that both facilities have to be in Ohio. And so, you know, that's uh, that makes sense. So we'll we'll look into doing that just to clarify that that's the situation. Thank you. There that that provision was originally included to address um, uh, Pine Grove and um, I don't remember which Republic transfer facility it is. They're the ones who originally came in asking to do that. We approved it through findings and orders and then included in rule in case anybody else want, could meet those same criteria. And, and being the person who receives the checks, those work really well and we're really glad they get to do that. So thank you. And uh, next, Marcy Kress has her hand up. So Marcy, feel free to unmute and um, ask your question. Hi, Ernie. Hi, Marcy. If, if you could clarify for me the uh, transfer for composting, the intent yes. of that rule change is to make sure that we do not get fees as long as it goes to a compost facility because it is not currently written that way. The revision Correct. is... Okay, so currently just said if you went to a transfer facility, there was no further requirements, but the revision is going to enforce the fact that the only way they can waive that fee is if they take it to a compost facility. Yes, that correct. So okay. that whole provision, it's in there for a reason. I just can't, I can't remember why. And it, it seems to me that what happened is, you know, when 592 was passed, they put in place the disposal fee for solid waste districts, but the generation fee did not exist at that time. And I could swear that I remember there being a provision in 57, which is where the disposal fee law is, that it said something about yard waste going to a yard waste composting facility and then that transfer station thing. And then at some point, I believe the law got 
Well, so then then they passed the generation fee law, and mm -hmm. I think that they just didn't make them consistent. So we originally included them in a rule to make the generation fee thing consistent with the way the state fee law was. And at some point, I believe that they put a new requirement in, in there saying that any solid waste that went to a composting facility was excluded from rule or from, from fees. But I can't find the statutory language that was there when we first passed the fee rules. So we're looking into it. I just, I can't, I can't, I can't figure out, I mean, I can't follow history to figure out why that was there to begin with. Sure. But at this point, the intent really is just for solid waste that it, or for source separated yard waste that is going to go to a composting facility. If they then turn around and mix it with solid waste, then they have to pay fees on the entire thing. Okay, that was part of the uh, concern. So, and I understand yes. the origins of those things go way back. So thank you for clarifying that. I also am a little unclear and I apologize if everybody else understands this on, you mentioned the residual from a MRF and uh -huh. it, as it applies to state fees versus generation fees. Do you, do, do you mind restating that again, just so I can, does it currently uh -huh. not have fees tied to it or the residual from a MRF does have solid waste fees tied to it? So I think I think I've confused you. I think I've confused two things, Marcy. So I think the one you're talking about is the adjustment factor that a dirty MRF could apply to waste coming in to account for recyclables that are going to be recovered. Is that okay. was that what you're referring to? I, I I had a note that said it didn't necessarily apply to what was leaving a MRF that was going to a landfill. I probably. let me know okay so previously and 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 um if lisa burskin or or beth biggins or i'm reamer are on the phone i apologize for pointing this out but this was for medina county's dirty murph so when they were operating um the way things work you know is they would bring solid waste in the front end and then they would pass it over their uh their conveyor belt to remove recyclables and then they would send whatever's left off to the landfill uh so the way things would normally work in that situation is they would assess the fees on the inbound solid waste, then they would remove recyclables and then send the waste off to the landfill. But you can't collect fees on recyclables. So what? So they had to have a way of figuring out how much they had removed from the solid waste for recycling so that they didn't charge fees on that amount. So what Medina County asked us to do was to say, OK, we know over the past three years, the MRF has recovered this percentage of what's coming in the door. So it makes sense for us just to say, then let's apply that percentage and reduce how much in fees we have to pay based on the waste coming in. So if we recovered 10 percent over time, then we just reduce the amount of incoming bound waste by 10 percent and then assess fees on that. And then whatever went off, then they would still pay fees and everything else that had ended up going to the landfill. At least that's how I understood it happening. I see Beth has her hand up and maybe correcting me. So, but Marcy, that that's the way I understood why that is there. So okay, I'll, that let, makes, I'll let that makes Beth, sense. I'll let Beth speak up and correct me if I've said something stupid. <laughs> So Beth, if you want to unmute yourself. I'm, I'm actually not going to correct you. Um, I, I guess my thought is, um, are there any more dirty MRFs in the state? And is this nope. language even applicable any longer? No, um, and we left it in the state fee rule just because, you know, it's our decision to make. So if one ever did come around and somebody asked us to apply uh, uh, a correction factor, it's under our control. Uh, so, but we did remove it from the solid waste district fee rule just because we we didn't feel like that was really our call to make for you guys. So, no, there are no MRFs in the state. Will there be any in the future? Likely not. But from the state fee rule, it's still there. For the solid waste district fee rule, it's no longer there. Or at least it's yeah. proposed not to be there. Yeah, I, you know, the other thing I might throw out is instead of applying a percentage, can you not simply just apply the fee to the outbound waste going to the landfill? Yes, um, we can. Um, that that That's that, another way of doing it. We that, The only reason we put it in rule the way it is is because that's how Medina was doing it at the time. Correct, and I, I would recommend it be based on outbound scale weights versus a, an applied percentage. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. 
And does that only apply to dirty MRF? That doesn't apply to that only apply. So the residual coming out of a MRF is not related to this rule. No. So okay. even 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 under a dirty MRF, anything coming out the back end after the recyclables have removed is still subject to fees. So if, even if we did have another kind of MRF, like if you're talking about a clean MRF, that's not what this provision is meant to address. But even with a clean MRF, they still have to pay fees on anything going to the landfill. That was helpful, Ernie and Beth. Thank you very much. Okay. I think that provision really was to try to to try to prevent record keeping high dikes on part of the MRF and you know things have changed since then so I think Beth's decision Beth's comment makes a lot of sense. Carol you have a question? Um, yeah the part of the rule uh, where it talks about fee collection um, by the landfills and the transfer stations can you clarify for us the origin of the new length which that the fees actually come from the originator, like the gen the household or the industry versus the way it used to be written, where it could just be the hauler paying the fees. Was there, was there some cha practical change that that additional language is meant to create? Are you talking about the customer language? Yes. Yes, that's the last time the fee rules, the, the waste industry got that put in. So um that was there that we that wasn't language we came up with that was language they came up with so that's where that came from is there a practical change that results from it i don't really know um i i don't even know where it came from i don't i mean i may have to get back to you carol because i may have to look back at our records to understand it I don't I don't remember what their point was. It did okay, use to I have a we, go ahead, Carol, I'm sorry. No, we just we had some conversations recently where they were talking about um, that they can pass along statutory fees to their customers, but things like designation fees and waiver fees, they can't. So I didn't know if this was to bolster that argument with their customers that they can point to something in rule that says we have to charge you or if because I thought they already were charging them. Oh, I'm sure they are, Carol. No, I this this was put in place when we adopted the rules like in 2010. So this is not a new thing. They got it put in then. Um, I I mean. They're not required to pass the cost along. The, the law, the rule doesn't require them to pass the cost along. I think that they just wanted, I think what they wanted to say was essentially, we already have a contract with, with the waste hauler for this cost, and now you're trying to pass this additional thing along to us. But again, I have to look back at my at my at my records to remember exactly where that came from. Um, and I mean, between you and me, I'm sure as a as practice, even if they have a designation fee, they're still passing that along somewhere. That's how it seemed, and so I just I couldn't figure out why this needed to be in there. It wasn't our idea. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I ask another question? Sure. Unless someone else already has their hand up. We've got plenty of time. Um, this is the part that nobody likes to talk about with the unidentifiable waste. And I know that we're probably one of just a couple districts that deal. And having more and more of it characterized as C&D versus solid waste. Um, are we seeing a basic state change in policy over what it used to be um, when they were supposed to characterize it as MSW if they couldn't tell what it used to be? I can't speak to that, Carol, because I'm not involved in any of those discussions. Um, you know, what what we can do is I can I can have you I can have you talk to the people who are in the C and D program because they would know better about that. I don't 
I'm not in tune with that whole issue. Hey, Ernie, it's Michelle. I can I can speak to it just a tiny bit. OK, um, so in the in the statute of uh, pulverized debris is still considered CNDD. However, we don't allow it to be accepted at a CNDD landfill. So I know that we've had some policies in the past that might have tried to say being considered solid waste, but we we're not necessarily moving away from that, but but it's not really an, an accurate statement to say it's solid waste. We're it's still construction and demolition debris. However, the construction and demolition debris landfills are prohibited from accepting it for disposal. So then it has so to go to an MSW landfill. So in the past, we were given the understanding that if waste came in, say, in a rail car, and you couldn't tell what it had been. It, they had to choose MSW if you could not readily identify it as CND. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, and and that that is something that we're still working on as a division because we have um, obviously you're probably aware we have the CND industry making an opposite argument that you have. So we have it coming from us at, at both angles, and so we do need to take a better look at what fees we assess on pulverized debris but um yeah but we we are trying to i don't want to i don't want to say move away from the policy but we are trying not to um use that policy as much anymore just because it's murky and as interpretation it, we're getting two sides of interpretation so as we work that out we're going to keep people up to date on how better to assess the fees on that pulverized debris okay thank you you're welcome I don't feel appropriately seared yet, so please ask more questions. Carol. I'm sorry, but I had a list. No, that's okay. I've, that's why we're doing this. I've been asked to um, champion for the townships on the host fee for stronger language about how they split the funds and how that's decided. I understand that the, um, the additional flexibility is a really good thing and they're, they're very glad for that, but you hit it on the head with when there's three townships and it still reads they all have to agree and one is never going to agree because they're getting most of the money it doesn't add any um, tools for the township to use. There's, they still don't have anything to fall back on, like two out of the three have to agree or anything like that. Is yeah, there a possibility I know what, that could be strengthened? I, I know what you're saying, Carol. The problem is that we have two two situations where they already have that fee distribution on the books. And so if I, I don't I, I don't know that we have the ability to negate what they have and force them to do something new. So if we put in I mean, if we just put in the rule, the only option they have is to do it equally. That would mean that they would it would negate what they have. And I don't know that we have the ability to override what they've already adopted. I was thinking more of in the second one where it says that they can come up with an alternative if they if they agree to have something like if two out of three of them agree or some process by which one doesn't hold all the cards. Yeah, but the, the problem is they all three have to adopt their own resolution. So um, I, I mean, we can certainly look in to see if there's another option we can come up with, but in order to get their portion of the fee, they all have to adopt a resolution. So you can't just have two of the three adopt a resolution and force the third one then to have it too. So it, it's just it's a difficult situation um, to try to to try to resolve for them. It, it definitely is, and that, that I know that they're going to be submitting comments too to ask you basically the same thing, just for something something to break the stalemate. Chet, you have your hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> so I mean, on that point, obviously, um, we've had a lot of discussion 
there's also uh, the point of the state somehow um, inserting itself into local governmental control. And so, although we understand the issue, we understand the specific issue and how it will, you know, relates statewide, uh, there's a resistance to being overbearing from the state's perspective and determining uh, existing agreements between, uh, in this case, three local government entities. And so there is, um, we have not been able to find a perfect solution in that scenario. And, and this is what we have come up with in regards to what we think is the best solution at this particular time. So um, it would require obviously all three to agree. Uh, realistically, we agree that the chances of that occurring uh, are not great because one of the entities uh, is making more than the other two. Um, but somehow there has to be um, involvement by all three entities in this case. And so okay, we struggle with that. There is a huge balancing act. I think maybe what Carol, Carol, correct me if I'm wrong, I think what you're saying is that in addition to the two that are there, it would be a third alternative as agreed upon and that as long as two of them agree upon it, it would force all three to do something. Is that what you're recommending? I hadn't really thought about that, but it sounds good. <laughs> I mean, you know, if they're going to submit a comment to us, we'll have to respond to it in some way. So, I mean, you know, we can talk more about if there's another option that we can think about. But as Chet said, there's a lot of hesitation on the state's part to meddle too much in local affairs. So, you know, it would have to be something that's not real onerous on our part. So if they submit the comment, we'll we'll look at it and talk about if there's another option too. I, and I totally get that, the, the overstepping part. Um, the way that they got to where they are now is that they said EPA, and it's none of you guys because you were all babies when this happened, but somebody from EPA came in and told them, this is how your fee is going to be split. And it was based on the working face and where that was sitting at the time. And so they dictated at the time, this is how you're going to get your fees. And since that time, and it's been a lot of years ago, since that time, there hasn't been a way for them to negotiate a new agreement between the three. And so they were really hoping for the for this language to give them that opening, but it it really only reiterates what can already be done and not it still doesn't because it still says facility so it still doesn't say you know based on the percentage of where the facility is the facility could be the working face the the permitted disposal area you know the entire facility the entire land owned by the landfill so it it still doesn't give them a way to renegotiate well in in Ernie, let me let me just say this i mean if someone has a better mousetrap than what we've been able to come up with, we're all ears. I mean, this is what's part of this public comment period is to take suggestions of folks to make a better product at the end of the day. Um, but that suggestion has to somehow include uh, protection of existing agreements. We, the state of Ohio, is resistant in coming in and telling local governments, listen, you have to negate an agreement, a legal agreement of which you at one point in time agreed to. And now we're gonna negate that. We're gonna change the rules and you're gonna start over. So we're all ears about if there's another solution to this. Um, and, and I understand the history of it and the reasons why it got to this point. Um, but we have not been able to come up with that per perfect mousetrap. And so, but we're all ears uh, and we'll take those comments and we'll respond to them. And, you know, hopefully there's a solution in it. Yeah. And if the local, if the communities, if the 
whoever's going to put in the comments on be about the host community fee, it's better if they have a solution they can try to propose to give us something to react to. So um, for what it's worth, okay, we, we had that. several conversations about this and how to try to fix the situation. We weren't able to come up with something. OK, thank you. Are there other questions I can answer at this point? If there's not, um, I'm going to send out the presentation to our entire solid waste district contact list. Oh, Rob, Rob has a question. Hi, Rob. Hello. Got me. Hear me? Yep. OK. I have one question. Are there going to be any changes to designation agreements? No, because those are that's not that's not in the fee rule. That's not one of the statutory fees that the rules address. So no, there's no there's there's nothing in the the rules about designation. Okay. That makes me happy as because that's where I live at. Right. No, we don't. That's not a statutory fee and the rules that we adopted to address only the statutory fees. All right. Thank you, Ernie. Mm -hmm. So as I was saying, I will send the presentation to our entire contact group. Um, we have the recording so that if somebody if you know of somebody who missed the presentation is interested in hearing about it, uh, we can make that available too. So, um, you know, again, we have a few more minutes. I'm happy to stay on here as long as people still have questions. So I'll just ask one more time if there's questions before we end the meeting. Okay, it doesn't seem like it. So again, I really appreciate everybody being on. Again, I apologize for any confusion that we created in how we issued this and anything. Um, I incur encourage you to um, to sign up for our listserv so that you get updates as they're issued. You will there will be another public comment period once we file with JCAR. So um, it's not the last chance for you to comment and it'll give you a chance to comment on whatever changes we do make from this point out. Once those are filed with JCAR, you would get a notice through our listserv to know that those have been filed and the comment period is open. So if you have any questions trying to, if you have any issues trying to sign up for any of the subscriptions through our listserv, just contact us and we'll help you get through that. And thanks everybody for attending and Michelle, yes, I, we'll, we'll make that available. Thanks everyone, have a good holiday season.